All right. Uh, thank you everyone for joining today's session um, and for taking some time out of your night to be here. Uh, also, welcome to everyone who's watching this in the future. Um, so hello, my name is Ali Greenslade. I'm a climate engagement coordinator and policy analyst with the Métis Nation of Alberta. Um, I myself am not Métis. I've grown up in central Alberta and MNA Region 4, um, the lands of many Indigenous people, namely the Montana, Erminskin, and Cree, uh, Ermins, and Samson Cree Nations, um, who live where I grew up, spending lots of time, my time, lots of time with my family at Pigeon Lake, um, and also picking and eating lots of Saskatoon berries there. Um, so my background is in environmental science and climate change action. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with the Métis Nation of Alberta on the environment and climate change team for a year and a half now, and I can't believe this is the ninth speaker spotlight session um, that I've had the chance to facilitate. Um, it really is a pleasure to be able to create a space to talk about um, environmental stewardship and climate change from a Métis lens. Um, so thanks again, everyone, for joining today. Um, and that's what the speaker spotlight um, is. It invites Métis community members and industry professionals to share their skills and knowledge um, and, and, and talk about these things. Um, so today we're really delighted to welcome Sarah Delano. Um, ever since we started this initiative and I was asking, you know, coworkers, um, who, who potential people could be to, to present, I heard Sarah's name, I, like several times, um, we've all, we've also had feedback asking kind of what kind of sessions and topics people would be interested in. And we've had, uh, quite a bit of interest in urban harvesting. So, um, here we are, really looking forward to today's session. Um, so thanks again for tuning in. Feel free to continue introducing yourselves in the chat. Um, I'll pass it over to Sarah soon, um, but maybe I'll just take a moment to introduce a couple of my colleagues that are here today. Um, Beth and Courtney will be keeping an eye on the chat. Um, if you have any questions, um, they are there, real people. Uh, they both just waved. I don't know, Courtney and Beth, do you want to just say hi so your face pops up? I think we're doing a standoff thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. Awesome. awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, so um, before I hand it over to Sarah, we'll begin the session by listening to some opening words prepared by Elder Nervous Spicer. Um, I'm going to give a quick update on a couple things that our teams are working on. And then we'll have time for questions at the end. So please feel free to type um, questions throughout the session into the Q&A tab or in the chat. Um, we'll keep an eye on those and then circle back to them at the end if they're not answered in the presentation. Um, we'll also have a few poll questions throughout the session. So keep an eye out for those. Um, yeah, moving along here. And I guess just a little housekeeping note, um, if everybody could keep their mics muted throughout the session just to avoid any background noise and then We've scheduled lots of time at the end for, for conversation. So uh, moving along here, um, this is the plan for today. Um, I'll keep my portion quick here. Um, and um, yeah, just uh, thanks again, everyone for joining. All right, so we're now gonna open the session with a prayer from Elder Norma Spicer, um, which she's pre-recorded for us. Um, and always, always creates a, a prayer really in line with the session so we can begin in a good way. So share that. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost, Heavenly Father, we praise you from whom all blessings flow. We gather today to learn of new places to harvest from the bounty of your creation that can help us sustain and nourish our urban families. We are grateful for the opportunity to share stories of our Métis ancestors, ways of living and being, and how many of them once dwelt, raised, and sustained their families from the wildlife, gardens, and plants they harvested on their river lots. We ask for your blessings, wisdom, and guidance as we exchange ideas to learn where we can harvest wild food and medicines and of the community gardens that grow, share, and let us participate in the bounty of their harvest. May our time together fill us with a sense of belonging and deepen our appreciation for our Métis culture and the beauty and wonders of your creation. With grateful hearts for your goodness, truth, and beauty, we place our trust in you now and forever. Amen. 
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Thank you again, Elder Norma, for sharing that with us. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment and share, if you're not familiar with the uh, Métis Nation of Alberta's Environment and Climate Change team, we um, do a lot of stuff. Um, so we do a lot of work in environmental monitoring and conservation, also renewable energy um, and climate change. I'm not going to go through all of this, but it's kind of a nice overview of all the work our team does. Um, and really that it is all rooted with, with m and citizen concerns. Um, so as I mentioned with this, with this session, it really came from feedback um, about what people are interested in learning about. Um, this whole initiative came from a, from a survey that was uh, at the annual General Assembly at our, our department's booth a couple of years ago. So um, yeah, any questions for our team throughout the session, please feel free to reach out. Um, we're always, always happy to chat. Um, while I have the floor, though, for a moment, I wanted to sh highlight one one um, initiative that we're really proud of. Um, if you haven't heard of the Métis Crossing Solar Project, um, we, the m &A, built a solar farm at Métis Crossing, um, and it recently just energized this week, which is really exciting. Um, it's a 4.86 megawatt solar farm. Uh, it's completely owned by the m &A. Um, and it will produce enough electricity to offset all of the M&A and affiliates um, use, which is really cool. So um, hopefully my tech works here and I'm going to share this quick video with you and then I'll pass it over to Sarah. So this would have been. Oh. Sorry, it didn't stop. Yeah, yes. I knew something was going to happen. So this would have been um, the first people to build a home, the first people to raise animals, the first people to plant a garden on this land and stay here would have been the Métis settlers in the late 1800s. We are a culture that's alive and thriving. So behind me we have the white buffalo where we share the stories of our past and the buffalo hunt and the buffalo council. And just to the north of us we have our solar farm which I think is a big move forward for the Métis people. So it's great for us to be able to share the past and the future all at one time. I think for many, many years, our citizens, and even more so now I see our youth, are very concerned that we all have to be concerned about climate change and what do we do about it. So I think it's, it's, it's important that we do that. The Métis Nation of Alberta, we just started looking at what to do around climate change back in 2017. We talked to over 300 of our citizens and they resoundingly told us that as a Métis government of Métis people in Alberta, we need to do something about it and make a measurable impact on climate mitigation. And it, it's so exciting to have a 100% Métis-owned solar project. Well, I believe the Métis Nation should be very excited. This is um, a huge piece that the Métis Nation has been talking about for a long time. And it it is the largest Métis Nation owned a solar project in Canada. So Métis people have coexisted with the land for hundreds of years. And uh, the, the, the shift in energy generation to a sustainable source is part of humanity coexisting with nature. And uh, that's where I see Métis knowledge and Indigenous knowledge coming into renewables is that we're creating a sustainable energy source that can coexist with the new way of, that we're moving in our economy. The solar farm consists of 12,840, 480 watt bifacial solar panels, 36 separate DC to AC inverters. So obviously there's the climate mitigation effect of this, which means that uh, we estimate that's going to be 4,700 tons of CO2 on the first year and, you know, and we'll get that over 25 years, so there's that piece. And uh, we're very honoured that the Métis Nation has uh, employed a Métis contractor and its own people in putting them to work on such a great monumental project for our nation. And it's almost like hanging out with my family again. It's a little bit different, like you can tell, but we're all almost still the same family. It's really cool, actually. Um, 
it's just been really refreshing to work with partners that are just so willing and able to support us. You know, ADCO as our partners here, Carvel Electric as, as one of our Métis subcontractors there. Everywhere we look, we just found people just really believing in what we're trying to achieve and helping us out. So you're actually getting to see somebody's dream uh, turn into a reality. Uh, and then that reality goes to improving the, the community. The, the milestone towards reducing our carbon footprint, transitioning to net zero, acting upon that climate change plan that has been in the works for a long time. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, and if you saw at the end there, the Métis Crossing Solar Project is now officially called Soleil Présent, which means a gift from the sun in Miche. All right, so that's enough for me. Um, just last thing, um, as uh, I hope you enjoy the session, um, afterwards we'll send out a follow-up email with a link to a survey about the session. Um, if you're an MA citizen you'll, and fill out that survey, you'll have a chance to win a $100 Visa gift card. Um, and we do really, really appreciate that feedback. Um, and if you um, haven't already, please feel free to uh, subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter. Always lots of great events and information in there. Um, and I think Beth has the link to that if you could share that in the chat if you're not subscribed already. Um, but with that, I will stop sharing and pass it over to Sarah. Thanks so much for being here with us today. All right. Thanks so much. Let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen and get things going here. Um, all right. Can everyone see that okay? Yep. Good to go. All right. So thanks. Yeah. Thanks yep, to Elder Norma Spicer as well for that uh, opening prayer. Really, really appropriate to what we're going to talk about today and thanks to Ali and Courtney and Beth and, and the whole team for inviting me. Today I'm really excited to to talk about that. This is my favorite topic to talk about, I always say, other than my my kid and my dog, of course. Um, and, and thanks to all of you as well who are here uh, listening. Thanks for thanks for your interest and thanks for listening. And I hope we can have a, a good discussion at the end of, of the talk as well. Um, so my name is Sarah and I uh, wear kind of a lot of hats. I'm a mom, I'm a teacher, I'm a student, and I'm a researcher here in the beautiful city of Edmonton. I'm located here in Edmonton. Um, and one of my favorite activities with my family, with my friends, with my community is picking berries and also doing some food uh, growing here in the city. And I've also been involved in some community projects and some research with respect to, to berry picking and food growing. Um, and part of that was making an urban harvester guide with the Métis Nation, um, and that was an, an, part of an internship that I did there. And then another thing that I've done more recently is to make a recipe book with a lot of other people from my community as a, as a community research project. Um, and I'm going to share that recipe book with you electronically anyways at the, at the end of this um, presentation. And so while I'm not an expert, I'm going to say from the beginning, I'm certainly not an expert in harvesting. There's probably a lot of people in the kind of virtual room today that might know more about some of these plants uh, than I do. But I have been doing a lot of exploring and a lot of connecting with other people and groups uh, that, that do work on berries, that, that pick berries, that are involved in community organizations, that, that do food, urban food initiative type work. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about my my experiences and, and some things that I've learned along the way. I'm going to talk about some berries that I do pick here in Edmonton uh, with my community and some recipes that that we've we've made and some of the stories that those recipes carry uh, as well. And, and hopefully that'll generate some discussion, as I said, uh, towards the end here. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure, as I said, that you all have a lot to share, so I, I'm looking forward to that. The title of my presentation is also the title of the recipe book that I'm going to talk about. And so Rat Roots and Reasons to Gather. 
rat roots. Probably some of you know that rat root is something that was traditionally harvested uh, by Métis people, but you'll see that I've changed the spelling to roots um, because rat roots sort of talks about those, those journeys that myself and my community have taken through the what happened in historical Métis uh, urban berry picking and then sort of what what's happening now in the present. So so thinking about some of that history um, and some of those places currently where we pick berries and then the reasons to gather are talking about um, what are the benefits to to urban gathering. So that's kind of the the story behind um, behind the title. And I like the term gather as well because it refers to foraging but it also refers to that coming together as community. And so I, I do talk a little bit about that generally in my research and, and we'll talk about that today. Um, so before we get started though, let's see, I would like to know, and I know some of you have let us know as you entered the room, um, but I'm interested to know if you pick berries or other plants uh, and or grow food in your city. I'm interested to know how many of you are currently involved in this in this type of work. And I think we have a poll question. There we go. And then as you're as you're answering, and I'm seeing lots of yes, some no, and that's good as well. <laughs> you maybe you will after the presentation. Um, and as we're as we're looking at the poll here, you can see some of the pictures in the background as well. These are some of the berry picking trips that I've done with the groups uh, that I'm involved in. And all of these pictures, actually all of the pictures throughout the presentation you'll see are of urban harvesting. So all the pictures are in urban settings. This one is in a ravine space, the first one in, in Edmonton, and then the second one is very close to the university farm uh, within the city limits as well. So I, I really like to highlight all of these beautiful natural urban spaces that we have um, and and that's something that I'm that I'm really passionate about about talking about and, and sort of raising awareness of all of these these lovely natural spaces that exist within our our cities here in Alberta. Um, so look at that we've got about a 90-10 split uh, lots of people doing harvesting and growing foods so we're going to talk a little more about that and I'll ask you a few more questions about uh, what you do and why as well as we move along. Um, do I need to share the results here? Can everyone see them? Sorry, I shared them for just a second. Um, it was about 90% of people said yes. Right. right on. I just sit, still see it on my screen, so I'll get rid of Oh, that. do you? Awesome. I've got it. <laughs> we're good. Okay. Um, so here's a little teaser of some of those berries that we're going to talk about uh, that that I harvest. And um, I'm just going to give you kind of a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about this evening. Um, so again, I'm going to start with those what we refer to as the rat roots uh, or the history, some of the history behind uh, urban foraging. A lot of it is really specific to the area that I live in within the city of Edmonton. So I'll just give you kind of a brief uh, history there. And then moving on to the reasons to gather. So why, why pick berries in the city? What are some of those benefits and what are some of the reasons that, that I do that? And, and some of the, like I said, some of the benefits that, that I think are associated with that. Um, and then we're gonna get into the juicy part, which is of course, what to pick, what kinds of berries we can pick. And I'm sure that a lot of you will have suggestions beyond uh, what I pick. But I'm going to also go through some of the recipes that um, my group and I created and, and talk a little bit about that. Then we're going to do a little bit uh, of information on where to pick and some of the, the concerns or some of the issues that come up around urban harvesting as opposed to harvesting outside of cities. And then from there, we'll move into the, the discussion. If you have questions for me or if, or if you'd like to share a little bit about um, the berry picking and the, and the harvesting that you do. Um, so moving on from there, we'll get right into the rat roots. And another reason why I'm calling this sort of journey through time uh, rat roots is because most of the harvesting that I do and that my, my community does is within this space here in Edmonton. Of course, this is a historical map, but this ravine still exists and it's called the Rat Creek Ravine and it's it's named after the muskrats that, that lived there. 
um, we have beavers currently. I haven't seen any muskrats down there <laughs> since I've been living in the area, but it's named after the muskrats. Um, and this is kind of a special area for me, not only because um, I'm, I'm actually, I grew up rural. I'm, I'm living in the city now and I have been here for 13 years, almost exactly because my daughter's turning 13 right away. Um, and like, I, I believe that something like 70% of people, of Métis people now live in urban settings. Uh, so similar to my situation. Um, but what's special about this is that when I when I moved into the city, I got right into this this ravine just because I wanted to be in some natural space, and I started picking things like rose hips uh, in that space, and I I started to meet other people in the neighborhood that were doing similar things. I met a few historians and and whatnot, and I I learned that this um, these river lots here. Uh, we can see this one is river lot 26 where the rat creek actually sits and this one is river lot 28 and i discovered that actually this fraser family are are some of my ancestors and my house i believe sits somewhere right around here i haven't surveyed it of course but somewhere around there so very interestingly i just happened to move into the city and land on the exact land uh, where some of my ancestors lived and, and likely harvested the same berries that, that I'm harvesting now. So I, I put a picture of my great grandmother's moccasins with the wild rose uh, and then the rose hip here and just kind of that, that interesting connection that I discovered living in, in, in Edmonton. And, and so I think it's important to also call attention to the fact that although I came from a rural place and I now live in the city, uh, there were Métis people, you know, living in the city of Edmonton and in other cities here in Alberta since essentially they they became what we would consider, you know, more, more modern, modern cities or or, or um, you know what grew out of fur trading posts generally, and and so some of the Métis River lots helped to form those original urban forms that that we see in a lot of our cities, um, and we see that here. And I'm I'm interested in those river lots because some of my history lies there, but I'm also interested in them because of the way that um, food was produced, how kinship was maintained within that type of land tenure. Um, and and also just uh, you know those those connections between the different families in the river lots, and so um, I'm I'm interested in the fact that they were those narrow strips of land where people could farm and garden, but there was also that access uh, to the river for things like trapping and foraging. So the the gardening and the foraging were were working together, um, as was mentioned in the opening prayer, actually. And um, the other thing with those narrow strips of land giving access to the river is that the houses were built relatively close together. So people could come together as a community to do things such as berry picking. Um, and it's been interesting to see how, how this has kind of been recreated as, as we, we harvest as a community uh, within the community. Where I live, which is actually uh, located in what's called Ward Métis, we have these lovely new ward names which are gifted to us by Indigenous women in the city of Edmonton. And my ward is Ward Métis because we have uh, so many of these river lots that, that shaped these neighborhoods where we live. Um, so that's a little bit about the rat roots, how I discovered about my own history through uh, berry harvesting and through just getting into some of these some of these beautiful natural spaces in the urban settings. Um, and then speaking about the reasons to gather, I like to actually my my great grandmother who was a relative to those those Frasers from the river lot was a Belcourt. And so I'm gonna start with a I'm gonna start with a Christy Belcourt quote that I think really sums up well why I think it's important to have these connections to food in urban spaces. And she says, you know, she mentions that when we're connected to plants, it connects us to the land connects us to medicines um, and tells us, kind of teaches us how to live on Mother Earth. And so I think those main reasons to gather are around how we connect to land, environmental stewardship within urban spaces, also health, individual health, but then community, building community, connecting to culture, 
um, and having that sense of kinship within urban spaces as well. I think those are all uh, made stronger through activities around uh, urban food and, and urban food gathering and growing. So I'm going to go through each one of those separately. When we think about, uh, first of all, health, when we're thinking about food, it's, it's always connected to health. And um, when we're thinking about gathering food, which is fresh and which grows close by, um, it has all kinds of health benefits. Just the fact that, you know, it hasn't been transported over thousands of miles. It's, it's very fresh. It's generally has, it's going to have less pesticides and less sort of things to, to make it maintain its freshness. Um, and of course, when we think about berries specifically, a lot of people refer to different berries as kind of superfoods because they have so many vitamins in them, so much vitamin C, um, lots of antioxidants. So lots of health benefits to accessing uh, some of these foods within the city. And there's actually this really great resource that the Métis Nation has created, um, which is their traditional plant guide. And it, it shows us a lot of these plants that were traditionally used, that we can still use, and it mentions uh, both medicinal uses and then food uses. So we can see on this page, I just chose a couple that I harvest, which are the wild rose, the rose hip. Uh, and again, they mentioned that, that vitamin C and the dandelion, which we can eat every part of. Um, and just being a, uh, being a mom and being a student as a, as a 40 year old now, I, I drink a lot of coffee and something that I've discovered is that we can make a form of coffee from dandelion, which has been fabulous. I, I certainly have not given up coffee, but it's a nice substitute now, now and again. So lots of, lots of different health benefits to some of these foods and, and, and medicines that we can access. So I think that's a really important benefit to being able to, to have local foods within urban spaces. Um, moving on to, you know, what's, what's beneficial in terms of land and in terms of um, the environment. So a lot of times we think about local food as being better for us uh, in terms of health, but it's also much better for the environment, uh, the health of the environment, if you will. Um, and it addresses some of those things which are really not sustainable about industrial food systems. Um, and those are things that are really impacting the planet when we think about uh, climate change and, and and environmental degradation. So things such as, you know, packaging, we have massive amounts of packaging within industrial food systems, a lot of monocultural growing, which is ruining soils, uh, in combined with uh, pesticide use with some of those, those large kind of factory farms. Um, and then probably the biggest one are the, the global transportation networks that are involved with industrial farming and industrial food systems. Um, which have really devastating impacts in terms of climate change. And a lot of times, you know, we kind of think, well, what we eat, it's such a small part of, of what contributes to climate change, but it's, it's something close to one third of greenhouse gas emissions are actually produced uh, during food production and, and transportation. So it's actually a, a, a pretty huge contributor to, to climate change. Um, and again, especially due to that transportation over long distances. Um, and so a lot of cities have declared um, states of climate emergency. We've got one here in Edmonton. And, and I, I think there's not quite enough attention paid to, to the, the impact of industrial food and, and some of the initiatives that we could be supporting more within cities that, that have to do with, with food gathering. Um, and then I think also when we think about environment and we think about connection to land, there's there's some missed opportunity, I think, with a lot of the traditional knowledge that Indigenous cultures generally and Métis cultures um, hold about how we relate to land and how we steward land. Um, and when I did this internship with the Métis Nation of Alberta, I looked a lot at um, Métis perspectives on the environment and on nature and how we how we connect to land. And, and one of the major things that, or the major differences that we saw is sort of the difference between seeing nature as a pristine space, which is removed from our experience, 
um, to more of this, this idea that we are a part of the natural systems uh, that we're living within. Um, and we see some of that with management of, of green spaces in cities. Sometimes we see them as places just to walk down a path or, or spaces where we should not really be interacting with nature. And, and I think there's a lot of room within city policy to, to open up our ideas of how we look at nature. And, and I think there's a big contribution to be made for, for seeing uh, food gathering and, and connections to land through food um, as a, a key part of that stewardship piece and, and a, a part that really links people in the everyday to to some of these climate change issues and, and really makes people feel like they are a part of, of natural systems and, and responsible for those types of reciprocal relationships that lead to better, better environmental outcomes. Um, one of the participants in the research that we were doing for the cookbook gave, gave us this quote, and I really liked it. It was about someone who really hadn't ever heard of picking berries in, in, in the city before. They were a newcomer to Edmonton as well. Um, and we went in and, and did some berry picking and they had this sort of thought shift around you know, what, what nature is. And I really like this quote because they talk about how the trees become good trees uh, just from that kind of interaction and that relationship building with natural spaces. They're seeing these, these trees as sort of a whole new thing and something that's really giving a value that needs to be that needs to be um, recognized and, and cherished. So um, lots of lots of things to think about around land, but I think connecting through food really creates those spaces to think about um, how we can better steward the environment and, and, and how we can care for these spaces when we when we do feel connected to them. Um, there's a really a really great book, which I think the book is called Eating a Landscape. It's by an Indigenous uh, author in the southern United States, and, and he talks about how we rebuild these relationships and, and rebuild connections to, to food and, and to space and to the environment through gathering foods, which is really, really an interesting kind of concept. Um, so moving on from that, uh, the last sort of reason to gather or, or the last benefit to, to gathering food in urban centers is just this ability to connect to culture, to connect to our neighbors, our community, our families, um, and, and sort of see that continuity of, of food traditions as well. And, and this was a big one that we looked at um, with the research group that I was working with. And that was a group of 10 women. And uh, they were taking a program through an organization here in Edmonton, which is called the Multicultural Family Resource Society. And I teach some classes there. And of course, I take all of my classes into the River Valley because that's uh, what I think is one of the best parts of, of the city and the classes for newcomers to the city. So we got into the, into the Rat Creek Ravine and I was showing them some of the berries that I pick. And there was really a lot of interest in, uh, in this, this berry picking and the ability to find food within the city. And a lot of questions started coming up as we picked berries. Um, people were asking me, you know, why can't I find these foods in the supermarkets? Or why don't I see more people picking berries in the city? And, and I thought that it was really interesting that people were asking those questions right off the bat. And, and there's a lot to be said for the reasons behind why we don't find some of these traditional foods in supermarkets and, and why there are a lot of people who don't know that we can eat these foods um, and so on. So as a group, my, my students and I decided that it would be an interesting research project to undertake um, kind of, you know, learning from the land and, and following the berries and seeing where that took us. Um, in terms of what we could learn there. And, and so I think that this third reason, this, uh, this connection to culture and connection to, to nature and to each other was the one that, that really interested me, me the most. And, and we started to do uh, this project around, um, you know, what can we learn? What can we reflect on? We started taking pictures, we started preparing foods, uh, and we started coming up with recipes as well to kind of guide 
uh, guide our learning and guide what we were doing. And so that leads us to the, the recipe book that I mentioned at the beginning. And you can see that it has that title, Rat Roots and Reasons to Gather. Um, and this is how we, it was sort of our, our method, how we learn from the land and how we learn from each other. It was a genre that was familiar to us. A lot of my students were really culinarily inclined, really good cooks. We work out of a community center where we have a really nice industrial kitchen that we can access. This is a really bad advertisement for my cookbook, but I personally am a really bad cook. So while I love to gather berries, um, I'm a little bit lost in the kitchen, but that actually worked out really well because it was a nice kind of leveling of the playing field where my students uh, actually ended up teaching me probably much more than what I was teaching in the class. So it was, it was really nice as a method uh, for community-based research. And we sort of took this idea a little bit uh, from this, this scholar, Mitchell, I believe he's a Cree man from Northern Alberta, who wrote this amazing paper about berry picking as a metaphor for community-based research. Um, and we took it one step further though, and we were like, no, let's actually do berry picking as research. Um, and what could we learn in that way? And, and we thought that making the cookbook was important as well, because it, it was sort of a way to share knowledge that was not really academic knowledge or professional knowledge. And it was a way to have some of these knowledges that are not always counted within academic spaces and within policy circles and to get some of these stories out there to say, you know, there's there's a lot of women's knowledge, there's a lot of traditional knowledge, there's a lot of different perspectives on, on food systems and on green space that we're not necessarily um, hearing within cities. And so this was, was the reason why we wanted uh, to carry out this research and to create the, the cookbook. And of course, the first thing we had to figure out was, what are we gonna pick? And what are we going to prepare? And so here's where I wanna know, uh, what is your favorite berry to pick? What are some of the berries that you're picking uh, within your cities? And I think we have a poll, there it is. So of course, not all the berries are listed, but I saw a lot of people saying they like Saskatoon's at the beginning. We've got some blueberries. Raspberry, good, choke cherry. Yep. Any high bush or low bush cranberry fans? Maybe they're too sour. And you can see in the pictures here, yeah, it looks like Saskatoon's are win. Oh, raspberries are creeping up. I think Saskatoon's are gonna win <laughs> with good reason. Um, and you can see some of the pictures on the screen. These are a few things that can be harvested um, pretty much throughout uh, Alberta. We've got um the beaked hazelnut uh which to me tastes a little bit like a like a chickpea a little bit when it's raw um the wild strawberry down here this is my daughter a couple years ago picking saskatoons and then we have those those rose hips all right so thanks for your input and again i'm looking forward to hearing about some of the things that you make with those berries as well i'm going to close this and I'm going to take you through some of the things that uh, that we picked, and some of the some of the recipes. Just a few of the recipes that we that we featured in the book, and some of the stories behind them. Um, and most of these berries were picked in the in the Rat Creek Ravine. You might recognize if you were really paying attention on the cookbook. The cover is a sketch. And it's based off of this photo. One of those co-researchers, one of the researchers that um, made the cookbook with me was also a, is, is a lovely artist and did all of the pencil sketches and, and the front cover on the book as well from some of the experiences that we had in green space and some of the pictures that we took. So it was a really nice, really nice bringing together of community. And actually I should mention that that, that book was entirely created by the community, nobody was paid to make that book. Um, I found a graphic designer on my community league board. We had this lovely artist as part of our research team. 
I had my best friend edit the book. <laughs> um, they probably owe her a favor now. Um, somebody in the community took most of the pictures in the cookbook as well. So it was a really, really lovely community project and, and all the proceeds from that book go into uh, further community programs as well. So going through some of those recipes, and I'm doing this by season because uh, we like to try to get into the ravine every season and do a little bit of, of harvesting in there. And uh, if you're new to harvesting, this might guide you as well, uh, a few things to pick each season. So the first thing that I find coming out in the spring are those caragana blossoms. It's of course not a native plant, I believe. Caraganas come, from Siberia, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. So they're very hardy and that's why we see them come out uh, first of all in the spring. And this recipe from the book you can see here is for an omelet because that was the first thing that my daughter learned to cook. So this is her recipe uh, in the book. And we really like this one because again, thinking about that connection to land, it gets us out in the spring. Usually we make this on a weekend. So we go down to the ravine pick a few uh, caragana blossoms and you can see we're still wearing toques at this point. Uh, and then we come back and make the omelet. And if we have uh, some, some chives that have already come up in the garden, we'll put those in there and, and some, some dandelion leaves if we find those as well, because they're, they're not quite so bitter in the spring. They're, they're quite nice as a green in the spring. So that was uh, one of the recipes that we did other things we pick in the spring, uh, lilac blossoms, the dandelion, most parts of that we can pick in the spring. Some of the berry leaves, so the I, I like the wild strawberry leaves for tea and, and then the raspberry leaf is also a, a, good, a good tea. And I think that I have, yes, yeah, so a lot of my students create these videos for me. I'm really not that technologically inclined. So, so far this presentation, nothing has gone terribly wrong. Um, but my students like to kind of document the work that we do in the River Valley and also the, the work that we do in preparing the recipes, which has been really nice. It shows me that there's interest there, um, but it also has given me these lovely kind of recordings of what it looks like when we come together as a community to, to create food. So I'm gonna show you this video quickly. Hopefully it will work. Um, and this is us preparing lilac and dandelion jelly, actually this past spring. All right, so a little glimpse into our kitchen. Uh, and if you haven't used dandelion before, I know the leaves can be very, very bitter, but the petals of the flower make a jam that's almost like honey. And you can also put them in cookies or pancakes or anything like that. And it's kind of like a honey flavor, as long as you're removing the, the petals from all the green, the green part. Um, so those are some of the things that we harvest in the spring. Summer, of course, is prime berry season. So things like Saskatoon's, those lovely wild strawberries, which are hard work to pick, but really delicious. Raspberries, some people pick blueberries. There are, that I know of, there are no wild blueberries uh, growing in Edmonton, but people who are here from Edmonton, you may prove me wrong if you know <laughs> of some spots. Um, and so the, the first thing that I wanted to talk about this recipe for a Saskatoon pie, it's called From the Queens in the North because it comes from a couple of ladies, uh, one lady who works for the Northlands Urban Farm, what's now called the Explore Edmonton Urban Farm. This is an urban garden, which is about five minutes walk away from the, the Rat Creek Ravine. And we met Patty through our research process. She, uh, she runs programs there and she's just such a lovely community connector. So we've 
we've since made a lot of connections with her just over kind of uh, inquiring about the work that they were doing there and, and what their connection is to to food and, and some of the berries. And so we've, through this process, we've come to have free tours of the urban farm with her. Our community center now gets uh, programming for our summer camps at the urban farm, which has been really nice. And we've done a Jane's Walk. Jane's Walks kind of highlight community involvement in city building. Uh, so we do a Jane's Walk together, which shows the urban farm and then it shows um, the berry picking in the ravine. So we really highlight the fact that we have these different food systems happening within the city, the, the gardening and the farming side, and then the foraging side as well, which is sometimes overlooked. Um, and again, brings us back to some of those practices uh, in the Métis River lots. And so we're really, really happy to have made this friend uh, at the urban farm through our, through our project. And I've heard that this pie is really good. I have not made it yet, but I, I've heard that it's quite good. The pie comes from Patty's mom. And actually, that's another thing that was really highlighted through the, the creation of the recipe book. Everyone mentioned their mom and their grandmother and all of these connections to food uh, through the generations. So this, this type of intergenerational connection has been a really powerful part of our berry picking projects as well. Um, and we almost always have kids. You'll see in all the pictures, there's there's kids around us. So kind of passing on that um, that knowledge of, of berry picking to the next generation as well has been an important part of the process. Of course, not to leave out the Métis Nation, we interviewed some folks from the Climate Change and Environment Department as well as part of our recipe book. And whoever we interviewed, we made sure they gave us a recipe because we really wanted to highlight the recipe as research aspect. So we got this really great Bannock recipe um, from the Métis Nation. And, and actually, I said there were no wild blueberries in Edmonton, but the there was a really great gardening project going on at the provincial head office when we were doing this research. And so they had created a really lovely garden with some blueberries, a bunch of other berries, some herbs, um, some vegetables and, and all kinds of things. So they created this garden space for different um, groups to access, which was a, a really lovely project. And that's why we came up with this or what, why they, they provided us with this blueberry bannock recipe. And I make this bannock every time I do this, this type of presentation in person. So I guess I owe you all some bannock because I can't do it <laughs> online. But I've made it a few times and it's a really good one. So I this one is... 100% recommended. Um, and then moving into the fall, couple of berries here, which really taught me some things. And, and that's why I really wanted to highlight these berries. And the first one are elderberries, which I didn't know we could pick and we could eat. I didn't grow up picking these berries. I did grow up picking a lot of berries and, and eating a lot of berries, but I had never seen elderberries before. And as I was walking through the Rat Creek Ravine, I would see so many elderberries. They're just all along the trail. And so I was just really curious and wondering, you know, can we eat them? And uh, thinking about this, this is kind of a way to learn, right? What Look at what's around you and then see who you can find that can tell you is it poisonous or not? Um, which of course is important to know uh, when you're harvesting things. And so I did hear from a, a few people that it was poisonous and that we can't eat it, uh, which is actually not true. We just need to cook it. It is, uh, it is slightly toxic if you're eating it raw. So if you eat too much of it, you can get a stomach ache and you know other, other kinds of things happening. Um, but when we cook it, it's, it's a really great uh, berry to use. It makes a really nice jelly. You may, and, and it's been used for generations and generations. This is a native plant. Um, you might have heard of European elderberries, which we see on a lot of cough syrups and things like that. They are purple. And if you will notice, our North American elderberries, I'm not sure if your screen is large enough to see, uh, but the stems that lead to the berries are this really lovely purple color. So that's a, that's a way to, to identify them. If you haven't seen them before, it's always best to, of course, find someone that can 
directly tell you and point out to you this is an elderberry um that's my disclaimer for the talk don't run out there and eat all kinds of berries that you don't know um but it was very interesting to me to learn about this new berry and then i did some research and and discovered that yeah it's, it's been used by people um indigenous people even on the west coast have used this berry um so so lots of uses for it uh, medicinal uses and you can also recognize it because it has really long and serrated leaves so these are all things you can kind of look up in in guidebooks they're going to give you some of these pointers uh, and so on but it was it was an interesting one for me because just being on the land I was able to to then kind of recognize some new plants that that I had never seen um, something else that we harvest in the fall in Edmonton are goji berries and we've probably heard about them as a Chinese superfood. And you might be thinking, what are they doing in the Edmonton River Valley? But they do grow wild there now. Um, and that's from, you know, our what over 100 years of, of having Chinese immigration in, in Edmonton and, and being one of the one of the first immigrant groups uh, in the city. And so lots and lots of history around the goji berry and lots of people doing interesting work uh, with the goji berry as well. There's a, a really interesting local artist who has worked, she had a kind of a residency at Fort Edmonton this summer talking about some of the history behind the goji berry. Um, so I was really interested to learn about it because again, it tells us some of these stories that we don't always hear about, um, which, is, which is really, I think, important in urban settings to be learning from each other and learning all of these histories. Um, so we also interviewed someone from the Chinese Benevolent Association here in Edmonton when we did our research. And then I was invited by them to a couple of activities where I was able to speak about uh, Métis perspectives on, on nature and speak about berries. And that, again, was a really nice community connection to build. Um, and this is a great soup for the winter. It's, it's very medicinal. And you can find all of the ingredients um, in an herbalist shop if you're in a larger city. Um, and then moving on from that, the choke cherry is where the whole project began. Uh, we did start picking berries in the fall, and there were choke cherries everywhere. Um, and again, people asking, oh, this, this fruit is all for free. Why don't people harvest this? And, and why don't I see this in the grocery store? Because it's such a it's such a lovely berry and it makes such a beautiful um, jelly as well. So the first, this was our first project. You can see it was in 2019. So before we started thinking about research, we were just coming together uh, and learning about some of these, some of these fruits and, and berries and, and doing, doing this work together as a community. So I'm going to play this, this one other video, which again, a different student created. I don't know how to make these <laughs> videos. And you might see my mom uh, in this video, because again, uh, those intergenerational connections. The first time I was supposed to make jelly with this group of people, I realized I don't really know how to make jelly. I just know how to pick the berries. And so I had to call in reinforcements from my mom and say, mom, I don't know if this is going to set. I need you to be present. So she came into the city and, and helped out. So here goes the, this is our first foray into uh, jelly making. <laughs> winter because most people harvest these berries in the fall uh, but I really love to harvest berries in the winter 
um, because I think it's really important to continue to connect to natural spaces in the winter to get outside, get that vitamin D. Um, I, I love to go outside in the winter uh, and especially because our winter here is so long. So these are two berries which we can harvest in the winter, rose hips and then high bush cranberries. Um, and this is our, our my kind of last recipe that I'm going to show you, but you can also see I've harvested some high bush cranberries uh, and it was bitterly cold. If you look at my hair and eyelashes, you can see how cold it was. This was last year, actually, as part of a project we were trying to put together for, um, I think it's called Children's and Family Services at the Métis Nation, Family and Children's Services, something like that. Um, and so I went out in that minus 40 snap that we had last winter. And so you can see how juicy these berries look even at minus 40, which is kind of incredible. Um, and being able to get out there when you're going on the River Valley trails in cities, when it's minus 40, you're not finding a lot of other people there. So it's a very peaceful, really nice kind of stress relief uh, situation. I ran into a deer on this walk who had the same like iced up eyelashes. We were very close together and it was kind of a beautiful thing. Um, and I think that Something that's important about urban harvesting, which I mentioned a little bit uh, when we were talking about the environmental benefits to it, is that it it does connect us in such a way to our natural surroundings, and you know it makes you realize being out there and there's a there's a deer in your face or there are these little chickadees kind of coming close, and especially in the winter, you realize about you know food scarcity and the fact that we're sharing these these uh, natural foods with all kinds of other um, animals and all kinds of other people. So I've always been taught you should only pick kind of one tenth of what you see on each bush or each tree. And I think within urban settings, we have to be even more mindful of that and, you know, pick a little bit less uh, because we are many more people in the cities than in some of those, some of those berry patches in the rural areas. So that was kind of one, one thing that I took from the, the winter picking session. And then the high bush cranberry was also my great grandmother's favorite berry. So I'm taking us all the way back to the beginning of the presentation and some of those connections to the land. And I called my recipe in the book, um, the five generations forest berry beet loaf. It's a long title. Um, and that's named for my great grandmother, Florence Belcourt. Um, and it's five generations because my daughter who helped me make the, the loaf would be five generations removed from my great grandmother, uh, Florence. And that means actually it's seven generations from that river lot family that we saw uh, in the image from the beginning. So an interesting kind of full circle, seven generation story within beet loaf, which was uh, something that my great grandmother used to make. We took the beets from uh, some urban gardening projects that we were doing. And then the high bush cranberry glaze uh, came from those those high bush cranberries. There are a few in the Rat Creek Ravine, but actually, for those of you who are in Edmonton, South Edmonton is the key the key spot for high bush cranberries. Um, but again, kind of kind of brings us full circle and and thinking about some of those benefits, connection to family, connection to culture, cultural continuity, environmental stewardship, all of those things that that we really think are are you know pivotal to having access to urban foraging and, and carrying out urban foraging as well. So mostly full circle, but everyone always asks me these questions about, okay, but there are some issues with <laughs> urban foraging. Where should I pick? Is it safe to pick? What can I do? Um, so to kind of wrap up, we have this lovely um, Métis Urban Plant Harvesting Guide, which the communications people made extremely lovely. I can't take any credit for that, um, but I did help do some of the research on this guide. And so it it's going to help you, and we're going to have a link to it at the end of the presentation. Um, it's going to help you to determine things which are important in urban settings, such as are there pesticide concerns that I need to be thinking about? And so you can look at the guide to find places where there might be pesticide use, where there is regular pesticide use within cities, or where pesticide free areas are. If it's an area where you think there might be pesticide use, you can always contact your municipality. I believe we have five municipalities um, in this guide. But any, I always recommend to people, if you're unsure, you can connect uh, to the municipality 
directly and they can tell you about what the what the pesticide use is within that area. Pesticide free areas tend to be around large bodies of water. So if you live in a city with a river running through it, as many of our larger cities in Alberta have, um, the, those areas around the rivers tend to be pesticide free or way, way less um, or it's way less likely that they're using pesticides in those areas unless they have a major noxious weed situation happening. So those tend to be safer spaces to um, to harvest. Of course, don't don't harvest in off leash dog parks because it's gross. <laughs> it's maybe not unsafe, but it's definitely you know not ideal unless they're high bush uh, things and varieties. That's fine. Um, I always recommend going out and seeing what's around your your area. Are there any parks? Are there any natural areas? Talking to your neighbors about what they harvest is helpful. And the MNA has all of these resources, right? The urban harvesting guide, the traditional plants guide. So those are those are good things to access. There are all kinds of books and guides which can help you figure out what you can pick, what you can't pick, where you might pick things. Some of them are very specific. I just got a really great one um, that's specific to Alberta and specific to berries. It's just all the berries that you can eat in Alberta. There's more general guides as well. You can buy them online. You can find them usually at your local library as well if you don't want to purchase them. Something that is pretty great as well is that a lot of municipalities have urban fruit maps. A lot of them are citizen kind of driven and run, so you can also suggest places where we find fruit and berries. I generally don't. I, I feel like I don't want it to be completely public knowledge where all of my all of my secret berry patches that I've been finding over the last 13 years are. Um, but if you want to come out with my groups, my community groups and pick berries and you're in Edmonton, uh, you can you can send me an email as well, because I'm really happy to to go and harvest with people. And, and we do events at my community league fairly often around berry harvesting. So let me know. Um, and I, I would like to know before we look at some of these urban fruit maps, uh, where do you gather or pick food in your city? Maybe you don't, maybe you will now. <laughs> um, maybe your own yard, uh, friend or relative's yard, right? Often we're, we're sharing food in that way, or maybe in a city park or a natural space. Where do we see people harvesting? Okay, interesting. So I think maybe we have some gardeners. I'm seeing a lot of my own yard. Any relatives? Some in the city parks, not as many. Good, excellent. All right, thanks for that. And just wanted to quickly show this is a this is an image from the Edmonton fruit map. You can see the Rat Creek here. You will see that they have not identified any fruits or berries in the Rat Creek. And I'm not telling, <laughs> but there are many, many in here. You can see though that along the more kind of uh, close to the community spaces here, we see a lot of, I believe, apples and, and choke cherries. So if you're interested in accessing um, some of these fruit maps, I found so, I found one for St. Albert, one for Calgary. There's likely others. Uh, you can do a quick Google search to see if there's one in your area. And then this is my, my final kind of thoughts. Uh, so why do we gather? This is, this is the main point of my my presentation that it, it's just such a such a kind of holistic activity. It's so good for us in, in so many ways. And I, I think some of those key reasons are around, you know, social inclusion, being feeling like we belong in the spaces that we're living. That's a, a really big one. Um, of course, health, um, health benefits, getting out there and exercising feeling the stress relief of being in natural spaces, eating those healthy foods, our cultural continuity, right? Being able to connect to different generations of our families, being able to, to keep our food systems intact, I think is, is also really, really huge. Um, and then I think the second point to make is that um, when we're harvesting foods, there's a, there's a kind of civic inclusion that, that could, could increase, I think, 
over time around how we use land and how we understand land and food in cities and how that relates to environmental stewardship. I think um, that we hold a lot of knowledge uh, as berry pickers uh, about the land that 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 we have within cities, the natural spaces within cities and and how we can better feed ourselves, feed our, our families, feed our communities within urban spaces over time as we try to address uh, some of those some of those climate impacts. And, and I, I, I think there's, there's a bigger voice uh, that could be had for, for alternate perspectives such as Métis perspectives on, on urban space. So I always like to see, you know, those, those inclusions of our, of our experiences and of our voices in, in more public uh, forums, like to do talks like this one uh, and, and attend talks like this one by, by other people who are doing this kind of work in, in green space. Uh, and I have a quote here that came from one of the interviews with someone from the someone from the Métis Nation uh, talking about, you know, that we've had these amazing connections to land and knowledges about land over time. And, and some of those have become fragmented and especially in urban spaces. And so just the the ability to have spaces to reclaim that are really important. And I think that those spaces exist within urban gardens and and within urban natural spaces and so i'll leave it at that i'm gonna i'm gonna end with one last video uh which is part of our as our cookbook was launching we did some public events in the green spaces to raise the profile of of some of those um metis uses of space uh and and metis harvesting within space so we can see some fiddle music returning to the Rat Creek Ravine, probably after generations. I'll just quickly show you this and then I'm happy to take any questions and to hear about some of your experiences in green space as well. Well, thanks again, folks. I appreciate y'all for listening to me all that long. All right. So my very last question for you all, and hopefully this will this will lead to some discussion. Uh, I'd like to know why you think it's important to prepare local food, to harvest and to prepare local food. Um, and you have some some options to choose from. Oops, I can't see them right now. There we go. Um, so maybe it's not important or maybe you don't do it. Maybe you don't prepare local food currently. Uh, it might connect you to your family or your community. Maybe it connects you to your culture uh, or to the land or maybe both two and three are true for you. Do we have a poll question for this one, Ali? Sorry, it says it's launched, um, Is it just but me it's that's not, not me? me click on it. Sorry, can anyone else see it? I don't see it either. I don't see it. Hmm. Nope. Well, Sorry, we move, team. We can move right into the discussion because actually this question was just sort of to to begin thinking about, you know, why are we doing this this kind of work? Because I, I think I feel like from looking at the responses to most of the questions, a lot of you are doing a lot of this this same work in some of those urban settings. So we can we can move on just maybe to to any questions that there are um, and anything that uh that people want to share about the work that 
that they're doing. This is a, a thank you from myself and my whole research team. So you'll see lots of languages there because a lot of my, my co-researchers were newcomers to, to Edmonton from other places. Um, but thanks again for listening and I'm, I'm open to any questions or comments. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. That was awesome. Um, I don't know if it's just dinner time now, but hearing about all those recipes, I'm, I really want to try some blueberry bannock and dandelion leaf uh, jam that tastes like honey. That sounds amazing. Um, but you do such a great job describing kind of, you know, this disconnection from food and, and nature that I think lots of us feel. And, you know, in a day and age where you can order dinner on an app on your phone, um, and not really know where it's coming from and it shows up in on your doorstep um, versus like actually going out and understanding um, what you can eat and harvest and why that's important. That's so great. So thanks again. Um, yeah, we'll open up the floor to questions. I know the chat's been quite active throughout the session. Um, maybe we'll just get started with this one in the Q&A. Um, Tara asked, um, do you know of any groups in the Calgary area that do urban um berry picking walks or anything of that nature I wonder and I don't um but I wonder Courtney if you are in contact with anyone who does walks or 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 berry so the only we don't do berry picking but I mean we do do the traditional plant walks down in Calgary now but aside from that I'm not aware of any berry picking specific walks in the Calgary area Thanks, Courtney. Um, also, Courtney knows where all the blueberries are across the <laughs> province. So if anyone <laughs> has questions, she she's your girl. Um, <laughs> um, Sarah, maybe I'll ask if you want to just stop sharing your screen and then we can kind of open up the floor to questions so then people can jump in if they like. If anyone wants to go first. We did have that one question earlier from Kayla Raymond asking, where can I find some of these classes? And I think it was in regards to the students that you go out with. Yeah, so so most of the work that I do with the classes and the research that we did, those were for newcomers to Canada, which is, which is one of my jobs. Uh, I work with people who are new to the city and just kind of getting used to some of the city spaces. And so we've, 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 turned some of that programming into natural space programming but my community league uh, does also do a lot of these kind of walks in the ravine and and we do berry picking um so our and i can write it in the chat maybe our community league is called parkdale cromdale community league so if you go to parkdalecromdale.org that's our website and we have like a facebook page and and whatnot as well um, or you can send me an email and I can I can send you the the information to the community league we do we tend to do um, a few a few of these types of programs a year. Awesome. Um, a few more questions popping up in the Q and a now so we'll go through those. Um, any any advice on the easiest berry to pick? So choke cherries are so easy. Um, because they grow like grapes so or some of my participants actually have said oh it's just like harvesting coffee actually which is interesting um, of course they're a little harder to process because they have that big seed in the middle uh, which is why we tend to make jelly out of them uh, because we can just sort of um, cook them and get the juice off of them but those are super easy to pick um, because it's just like you get a big clump in your hand as you're picking high bush cranberries as well grow in in groups like that also have a pit. Uh, so probably the easiest to pick and eat would be Saskatoon's, I would say, in, in my opinion, right? They're pretty easy to pick and you don't have to pit them. You can just eat them fresh. Awesome. Um, on talking about processing as well, um, do you have the processing of rose hips in your book or any advice on that? Um, I don't. So what I usually do with rose hips is just dry them for tea. Um, and when I pick them in the winter, they're pretty much already dried or in the fall or winter. Like if you pick them right now, 
you can pretty much just use them for tea, store them in a like a paper bag or something like that, and they'll dry a little bit more. Um, I know some people use dehydrators and things like that. I find it just too time consuming. I would rather put it in a paper bag and just let it <laughs> let it dry out um, just kind of naturally. Um, and there are people who make tinct tinctures <laughs> out of them as well. I think adding alcohol is what people do for that. Um, I don't do that. I generally use them for tea. I did make a, a rosehip soup once, which was really, really good. That was a Scandinavian recipe. Um, but uh, generally, generally my, my expertise kind of, kind of ends at drying them and, and making nice tea with them. I, I do really like the tea for the winter season because it has so much vitamin C. So it kind of staves off the, the cold and flu that's, that's always swirling around in winter. Great. Um, and picking up from the easiest berry to pick, um, what do you think the hardest berry to pick is? Hmm. That's a good question. The, um, the elderberries are probably the hardest berry to clean, uh, if, if that counts, because they're so tiny. They're actually fairly easy to pick because they're it's also a clump. But because the berries themselves are so tiny, when you pull the clump off, they usually each one has a tiny stem left in it. Uh, so I find it really tedious to go through and clean those ones. And they they tend to kind of come apart as you're cleaning them. It's uh, it's labor intensive. That's that's another one of the reasons why I like to do berry work in community, um, because standing over my sink all by myself for hours, you know, picking apart berries is is not as fun as hanging out with other people. And And so, yeah, but in terms of picking berries, I'm not sure that any of them are super difficult. They're all difficult if it's a bad season for mosquitoes, right? And that's another reason why I like the fall and, and winter harvesting. Fair enough. I know I found was um, out with Courtney last summer doing some traditional plant monitoring and they were, Courtney and the rest of the team were picking um, wild strawberries, like nobody's business. And I was like, how are you guys seeing these so quickly? Cause they're so small, so, um, but so delicious. <laughs> Um, I'm going to pop over to a question in the chat. Um, there's a couple of comments about rat root, actual rat root. <laughs> um, and, uh, wondering is, do you know of any class or know of any classes, um, on harvesting rat root, um, or any kind of resources on that? I might pass that over to Courtney as well. And if there is one, sign me up because I don't know how to harvest rat root either. <laughs> So this comes up a lot in the walks and it's it's generally information that's quite guarded <laughs> is what is what I've encountered. So unfortunately, I don't really have a satisfying answer for that either. Yeah, fair enough. Um... I, I, I think it could be a matter of finding <laughs> finding your local knowledge holders and building relationships with them to kind of suss out that information because yeah it's just it's just not really publicized a lot yeah, build yeah those absolutely things. sorry <laughs> um another question um in the q a here um wondering about making cranberry juice would high bush cranberry be suitable cheryl asked yeah so in the cookbook there's a recipe for a tea um, which most of our most of our participants drink cold. So I think that the issue with making juice from high bush cranberries is that as far as I understand, they can also be a little hard on the stomach when you're eating them raw. So when I go out and pick high bush cranberries, I do eat them raw as opposed to the elderberries. I've been told like, don't, you're going to get a stomach ache. High bush cranberry, I will eat a few of them, but they're quite tart. Uh, so generally I'm not like, you know, eating handfuls of them, but I have heard that um, when you're using them in, in larger quantities, you should be cooking them. So my suggestion would be to make more of an iced tea. Uh, and, and that's what we've done. We've added a few different berries, including the high bush cranberry. And then we added um, some lemon juice and some honey. And it was summer when we prepared that. We had some frozen berries. Um, and so we we had it as an iced tea and it was it was really quite good. 
Great. Um, another question about uh, resources here. Um, any good references or guides for picking different teas? That's another one where I would sign up for the class. Um, what what I know about teas is, is mostly things that my mother has taught me. Um, my mom is not Métis. My father is Métis. And so my mom is from the East Coast. And I, I grew up with teas that she gathered, which would be, you know, mint. Um, the, the strawberry leaf tea is supposed to be good for, for stomach issues, upset stomach. Um, raspberry leaf tea, my mom told me to drink as much of it as I could when I, when I was ready to go into labor because my daughter was like a week late uh, arriving and, and it's supposed to uh, induce labor, which my doctor told me is not true, but my mom told me was true drank a lot of raspberry tea <laughs> that's kind of eventually my daughter came out um that's that's all I really know about teas to be honest um chamomile tea that kind of thing that I would gather um with my mom but I'm I'm not an expert either on on local teas or or some of the more you know medicinal teas Courtney is there anything that that you would add to that how to find tea I, th I could name a couple good resources. Like I have a couple books that are really good resources for preparing teas. I don't have the title offhand, but I'd be happy to share them in the chat or as the fall as part of the follow up. Because yeah, I have had some books recommended to me in the past. Thank you. Yeah, and all all the links and everything we shared today, I'll send to everyone in a follow up email so I can get those books from you, Courtney, and make a little little resource guide. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm happy for people to just jump up and ask questions um, or raise your hand or just jump in here. Um, I'm sorry, I might have lost a few of the questions to the chat. Great to see everyone very active in the chat and offering suggestions and advice and answering questions as well. Five minutes here, if time for a couple more questions. Beth, you usually have a couple couple of questions queued up. Any anything for Sarah? Put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, I have many. Um I thought of so many. Um one question because I live downtown. I was wondering how much I should worry about pesticide use uh, when I go on the trails around my place. Um, is there things I should avoid picking? Because, um, yeah, I'm sure there's some being used like near the golf course, downtown, things like that. Yeah, the one place where I would say not to harvest would be a golf course. Okay. Um, because <laughs> of all the places within cities, they're the ones that will see the most pesticide use unless and, and you know what over time it's changing a bit like cities are becoming a little more aware of some of the damages that that pesticides are are causing to to health and, and things like that but yeah golf course is probably the number one like it's not the best place to harvest I do though most of the like the the Rat Creek Ravine is actually very close to downtown um, it's just very close to where the football stadium is Mm. So connects to a lot of those same trails that then go into downtown. Most of the River Valley trails, they very seldomly use pesticide there within Edmonton. Um, the only time that they would use pesticide is if they have some kind of crazy issue happening with noxious weeds. And actually, even then, it's very rare. Like most of the time, they'll try to hand pick them or they'll try to get rid of them in some other way um, because there's a lot of there's a lot of interests in the river valley in, in Edmonton and there's a lot of lobbying around really keeping those those spaces natural so you won't often find pesticide use there it's I would say um, it's probably the best place to to harvest within Edmonton even if you're downtown um, as you move out of course the spaces become a little more natural and 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 some less traffic depending on on where you are but in terms of pesticide use you should be fine in the in the downtown and if they are using pesticide use within the river valley they have to put up some signage about it uh, so you'll you'll see that go up as well awesome that's great i think we got another in um 
in the chat since I said that. Ali, do you want to read that? Yes. Um, question about, um, are, are there different types of rose hips um, and are any of them not edible? I just read something about that today, actually. Uh, where did I read that? Maybe it was maybe it was even in the Métis Urban Plant uh, Guide or the Métis Traditional Plant Guide. I'm not sure, but somewhere I just read that there are like a, a whole lot of varieties and that all varieties of roses have edible rose hips. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not an expert again, but I read that <laughs> recently that they're all edible. Um, and yes, there are lots of different varieties. You might notice some of them are longer. Some of the rose hips are longer. Some of them are smaller and, and rounder. Um, you don't want to eat them, of course, the full berry because they've got those furries inside of them. I think actually there's a I think there's a there's a Cree story about someone who eats a whole bunch of um, rose hips and then ends up having a really interesting time of going to the bathroom afterwards. Um, so you don't want to eat the full berry. Uh, they're great for tea. I remember as a kid, we used to eat around them, though, or like a little tiny apple. Uh, so you can do that as well. But as far as I understand, there there are many, many varieties of rose hips. So even if you have a like not a wild rose plant in your in your yard, you can eat those rose hips as well. Good question. Add to that, I've also heard about, and I haven't tried it myself, just scooping out the little hairs with your nail. So then you can eat it, but I haven't actually tried that. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Great, lots of questions and thank yous in the chat. Um, time for maybe. I wasn't paying attention to the more. chat as I was speaking, unfortunately, but I'm seeing a few of those those messages now. Uh, and nice to see that that people are doing doing different kinds of work with Hascap and Saskatoon and and all kinds of things. Great. Well, maybe we'll just wrap up here. Um, once again, if anybody has any other questions that didn't get answered, um, please feel free to reach out to climate at Métis.org and we'll make sure that um, the questions are sent to the right people. Um, also, I think, Sarah, you shared um, your email. I can share that as well um, when I send my follow-up email. Um, so you'll know how to get in touch with Sarah if you have any other questions. Um, but with that, thank you so much to everyone who... Uh, hung out with us tonight and stuck with it for this hour and a half um, and and to, to learn and chat together. So thank you again. And thanks to Courtney and Beth for helping out and um, have a great night, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you.